where they speak the Queen's English, in case you don't recognise the accent. This is how the convicts from down under speak. This is what we have done to the British accent, and um, we've made it more posh than it already was. You Americans just threw the tea overboard and said, see you later. So, you know, that's <laughs> typical America. We'll do it our way, thanks. And so um, us Australians are still under the monarchy. But anyway, I, I love Pastor Rick and Kay so dearly. I got so fired up listening to what, you're, what you all are doing through the peace plan in Rwanda. And um, I just need to tell you, um, as part of the body of Christ around the world, we are so grateful for your church. We are so grateful for the light that you are to the world, the fact that you have continued to stay on mission and take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth and bring change and transformation. You inspire us all. I know you're suffering for Jesus here in Southern California, but someone has to do it. I do understand that, <laughs> that you are like, here I am, Lord, send me to the nations. Oh, okay, I'll stay in Southern California. So I, I get that, but what you're doing in Rwanda is amazing, the opportunities that God has opened to your pastor around the world. We from Hillsong have been so blessed by his ministry. You ought to thank God that you are planted in such a wonderful church under such great leadership because you really, really do have <laughs> phenomenal leadership in this house. So I love that. And um, I couldn't wait. I was very, very blessed when he asked me to come. The church has been awesome. Um, I turned 50 years old on um, Friday, so for two days, I have been in the second half a century of my life, and I love it. Uh, you know, I would, I would um, never go back to the first half century. That was really boring. It, life does not start till 50, I have decided. And um, it is like hilarious. I just love saying it, because it's just like, I'm in the second half century. It sounds awesome. Okay, so um, I thought there's nowhere I'd rather be on my birthday weekend uh, than with you guys. I do want to introduce you to some of the humans that are in my life because um, we all have humans and I had two that come out of me. So here is my, my daughter. This is my 14-year-old daughter. They'll be in the next service. And this is my Catherine Bobby and she is 14 and just beautiful, taller than me now. And um, I'm so grateful to God. One of the greatest gifts that's happened over the last six months is that she's grown out of my shoes. And so she now uh, will no longer steal my shoes because, you know, that just makes me very happy. And then um, I have my little Sophia Joyce, and she is 10 and just sassy and the delight of my life. And then I am married to the single most ravishing piece of masculine flesh. <laughs> on planet Earth. And so this is my husband of 20 years, and uh, he is a Ballarat boy from Australia. His mother had 15 full-term pregnancies in 17 years. And um, all the women are in sympathy in this room right now. And I'm just like, you know, there was no television in that part of Australia, so they disconnected that late. And so my mother-in-law used to think you were not even a woman till you popped, popped out number 10. And so I'm like, uh, that's why when I you know, had my two daughters, I would always say this is Alpha and Omega. This is the beginning and the end of my childbearing years. And um, you know, I didn't, I popped out my first at 35, my second at 40. I'm thinking any woman that pops out a kid at 40 needs a purple heart. But anyway, so that was, um, we're, we're done. That is the, the deal. So, um, you know, being 50 is a great milestone, I think. Um, you know, if you're under 50 in the room and you think that's old, it'll happen to you. Just live, don't die, and you'll get there. And so people are like, how did you get to 50? I'm like, I didn't die. And so um, it, it really wasn't that difficult. But, you know, 50 years ago, I was left in a hospital in Sydney, Australia. And uh, many of you may know that my husband and I oversee an organization called the A21 Campaign um, in 14 countries around the world where we help to rescue the victims of, of human trafficking. It, it is particularly meaningful to me. Uh, if you guys would just put my birth certificate up, and I know some of you have seen it, but there'd be so many new people, you would see that 50 years ago, you know, my birth certificate simply had the name unnamed typed in, and that I was number 2508 of 1966. And, it, you know, I guess the last couple of days, turning 50, I've reflected on this deeply. Because that kid that was number 2508 of 1966 left in a hospital, unnamed and unwanted. That kid that was then sexually abused for 12 years by several different men. That kid that grew up in the poorest zip code in my state, the third poorest zip code in the nation of Australia. That kid that was so marginalized because my parents were Greek immigrants from Alexandria, Egypt, and 
We lived in a very low class area, very marginalised because of our ethnicity. If you saw my big fat Greek wedding, that is my big fat Greek life. And so um, that's kind of where it was. And, you know, very also marginalised because of my gender. I grew up in a culture, very strict Greek Orthodox culture, where women were not encouraged to do anything or to aspire to anything great in their life. And um, that kid should have been a statistic. That kid, you know... Um, should have been addicted to something if I still stayed alive. But I am living proof that in and through a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you can start bad and you can finish good, that Jesus Christ truly does redeem lives and he restores lives and he turns lives around. He is so wonderful. So I don't know what your story is in this place today and to our online community and whatever campus you might be on, but I want you to know that God knows you, God loves you, and that God cares, and he took this unnamed, unknown, unwanted kid from the back of Sydney, Australia, and not only did he rescue my life, but then he now uses my life to help rescue other people. You know, I am living proof that God can even take all of the bad things that have happened to you and work them together for good, Romans 8, 28 says, and he's done that in my life, that everything that the enemy wanted to destroy my life with, God said, you know what, I might just redeem that and not only rescue her, but I might take all those unnamed, unknown, abused girls and children from around the world that are being trafficked, and I might just use this chick from down under to open the prison doors for those that are still bound. I might just use that very same girl that the devil wanted to destroy. You know, Every time we put a trafficker in jail, every time we see a young woman or a young man or a child rescued, I feel like Joseph in Genesis chapter 50 verse 20, and I feel, you know what, enemy, you meant this for evil against me, but God bent it for this very purpose to save many people alive. So devil, you can stick that in your pipe and smoke it. I'm going to make you pay till the day I die for the thing that you've done in your life. That's what you can do. That's the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He makes us more than conquerors. And you know what a more than a conqueror is? Is you take the very thing that the enemy wanted to destroy your life with and you turn it around and allow God to use it to give someone else a future. You know, the enemy wanted to de destroy me, but I'm living proof that your history doesn't have to define your destiny, but you can use your history to help give other people a destiny. So on that note, we're going to turn to our text this morning. I got myself fired up right now. I love Jesus. You know, I'm just, uh, I'm like, you cannot. I'm like those, you know, the, 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 um, in the book of Acts, the disciples were saying, you know, you might try to silence me, but we cannot help but speak of all of the things that we've seen and heard. I'm just one of those people that just really, truly did get saved 28 years ago. And every day, I am so grateful for that. I hope you are still so grateful for so great a salvation. Jesus Christ did not come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. I was dead, and now I'm alive, and I am so grateful to God for the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. So, Pastor Rick said that I was going to be teaching from Joshua chapter 1, and that's because that's what I texted him, that I was going to be <laughs> teaching from Joshua chapter 1. I do want to preface what I'm going to say with the fact that the whole Bible is inspired by God. Everything is good. If you want to read Joshua this morning, feel free to do that because every word in the Bible was written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so it's all inspired and great. I personally am going to read from Deuteronomy. You can stay in Joshua. I had spiritual dyslexia when I texted him. It was not his fault. It was mine, but it was by the time they made the video. I went, I'm so sorry. It's actually Deuteronomy, but the whole Bible's good, so it's okay. And so um, it would go there. I do want to mention, I wrote a couple of months ago, this book, Unashamed, came out. And, um, you know, I kind of, yes, yeah, some of you have read it and done the, the, the study. This is not a chick book. I know there's a chick on the front cover, guys, but that's because I am a chick. Okay, so, um, I, I, you know, but the fact is, and it's not a book about abuse, it's a book about our worth. And, um, you know, two years ago, I went into a, um, 18 months ago, actually, some, some very intense therapy because I'd had some, still some broken areas in my life. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And God had a whole new season of influence and impact for our family 
But who knows that if God's going to make you more impactful outwards, he's going to go inwards and downwards first. And there was new levels of stuff that I just had to deal with because we all carry stuff, whatever might happen. I don't know what your story is, but that feeling of unworthiness right from the Garden of Eden, the enemy came in to the woman and he said to her, did God really say? And we have a world that is trying to drown the voice of God. The media tells us things, the politicians tell us things, and of course that's all true if the politicians say, you know, the politicians tell us things, um, you know, magazines tell us you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're not rich enough, you're not wealthy enough, you're not talented enough, you're not thin enough, you're not beautiful enough, I mean, it's endless. We get up in the morning and there's this fundamental feeling of unworthiness. We fail at things in our lives. Maybe a, a marriage fails, a business fails, a, a dream fails. Perhaps we feel like we failed as parents. Perhaps we are frustrated that our dream hasn't come to pass. Somewhere in there we feel like, I have just not made it. We have people more medicated than they've ever been, drinking more than they ever have, numbing our reality because somewhere it's just too much and we feel fundamentally unworthy. So the enemy came to the woman in the garden. He said, hey, did God really say you shouldn't eat? Now, here's the problem. If you don't know what God really said, you're going to believe what the enemy says. If you don't know what God really said, you're going to believe what the media says. If you don't know what God really said, you're going to believe what your ex-spouse says. You're going to believe the lies of the enemy if you don't know what God really said. And then the enemy said, you know what? God doesn't want you to eat of that tree because um, then you're going to be like him. He doesn't want you to be like him. Here's the issue. She already was like him because she was created in his image. And if you don't know who you already are in God, you're going to go trying to chase it through relationships, through money, through substances, through um, trying to climb the ladder. You're going to try to become what you already are in Christ if you don't learn to get it from Christ. And so the issue then is God comes into the garden after they've blown it. He's like, Adam, where are you? It's not because he didn't know. He's omniscient. He did know. He's like God. He's not like, oh, hide and seek. I can't see you. Well, no, that's not what he was doing. He's, he's like God, just in case you're wondering, like burped one day. Earth, oops, look what I did. Anyway, so that's, like, that's what God does. He's very powerful. God's not freaking out about what's happening in this country right now. You know, we all act like, oh, God, do you know there's an election? Oh, I had no idea. Oh, my God. No, I am God, all three of me. What am I going to do? Okay, I'm having an existential crisis. Peter, did you know that America's having, oh, no, what am I going to do? Do you think God's in heaven going, oh, am me. What am I going to do? I just don't know. It's, he's God. He's sovereign. It's all right, people. He's not like, well, he knew this was going to happen. He wrote the book, actually, wrote the ending, and it's all right. It's not all going, the sky's not going to fall. In fact, it's going to roll back, and he's coming back. Don't freak out. It's all not ending. It's culminating in what we're all going to. So it's okay. It's okay. You can sleep at night. That's another sermon. Okay, so let me stay on point. Stop distracting me, Saddleback. You are naughty. Okay. So in the, in the midst of all of that, God says, where are you? Adam says, I was naked, afraid, and so I hid. And then the Lord says these words, who told you? Who told you? And truly, that's my question today. The title is, don't say no when God says go. And a lot of us say no when God says go. And more often than not, it's because somewhere along the line, we believed a lie. I'm not good enough. I can't. I'm not smart enough. It's not ready yet. I don't have enough. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I can't. I can't. I can't. And we had a whole generation that said no when God said go. And a whole generation died in the wilderness instead of going into the promised land. And we need a generation of Christians that are not going to settle for the wilderness, but are going to go in and possess the promises that God has for us. The scripture tells us that in Christ Jesus, all the promises of God are yes and amen. You did not get delivered to live in the wilderness. You got saved for freedom. Christ set us free to go into your spiritual promised land. But somewhere along the line, the enemy told you a lie. You've believed it. And we've just stopped, stopped and settled for either a complacent, comfortable, apathetic Christianity or settled to say, my past, I failed so much, so God can't use someone like me. I was abused. God can't use someone like me. That business venture's failed. God can't use someone like me. Somewhere along the line, it's just too hard. It's too painful. And we just stop. And so really, I wrote all of that to go wherever you're at, from the highest corporate executive to the most broken person, the the one thing the enemy came at us in the garden was to tell us that we're not who we already are and to stop us from moving into the purposes of God. The only thing that God said we were not in Genesis 2.25 before the fall, Adam and Eve were naked and they knew no shame. So the enemy thought, 
He didn't say they knew no fear, they knew no doubt, they knew no insecurity, they knew no pain. It says they knew no shame. So the enemy thought, if I can heap shame on you, then I'm going to stop you from walking into your God-given destiny and purpose. Christians need to know who we are in Christ, what we have in Christ, and what we can do in Christ so that we can be the salt and light of Christ in a lost and a broken generation. We need to walk into the promises of God for our generation. So with that, I'm going to read from... Okay, you can clap. I'll breathe. Okay, how's that? I feel sorry for you. You're like, do we clap? Does she breathe? Turn to your neighbor and say, I have heard a rumor she breathes. I really have. You're awesome. I'm both Greek and a woman, guys, so it's okay. I only speak three ways, hard, fast, and continuously. So you will not fall asleep this morning. And um, so strap yourself in. We're going to go there. I am going to give you three points for the right half of your brain because Pastor Rick loves points. And um, if you're trying to take notes on me this morning, good luck. But I will give you three points. (laughs) so that we can feel like, you know, we've, for those of you that you will not sleep if there's not just something written down, okay? So I don't have the points have got anything to do with my message, but you can have a point, okay? So the, the Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy chapter one, these are the words Moses spoke to all Israel in the wilderness. Do you know God will speak to you in the wilderness? You might have come here this morning and you're in a wilderness experience. God will speak to you in that place, wherever you are. You can leave that up, guys. I love you all. I feel sorry for anyone that has to work any kind of machine when I'm speaking. It's like they they have to move in the spirit and really just go, word of knowledge, put it up. Okay. These are the words Moses spoke to all Israel in the wilderness east of the Jordan. That is in the Arabah opposite Saf between Paran, Tophel, Laban, Hazareth, and Dizahab. It takes 11 days to go from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea by the Mount Sea Road. I want you to see that. It's in the Bible. Everyone say 11 days. Okay, next verse. In the 40th year. I'm just putting it out there. In the four, we, could, we could actually stop right there and I could speak the next six weeks on that. It takes 11 days in the 40th year. How much of our Christianity is exactly there? What should only take 11 days? 40 years later. We're doing laps around the same old mountains, the same old issues. I was abused for 12 years. I was left in a hospital unnamed and unwanted. I did grow up in poverty. I did grow up marginalized. But the fact is, I am now 50 years old and two days, and I still take presents if you want. Um, And so I am now (laughs) 50 years old and two days. So nothing will ever change the fact that I was abused for 12 years, nothing. The blood of Jesus does not give you amnesia, just in case you're wondering. So it's not that your past didn't happen, but the blood of Jesus does give you a life beyond your past. And so I could have been here at 50, still walking around going, it was so bad. And man, you don't know what it was like to grow up in Australia 50 years ago to be left in a hospital. I really don't remember it, but it was really, really so bad. And just, I was just so rejected and it was so painful. And I'm still so full of unforgiveness because I don't know who my mother is. And I'm still so bitter towards all those guys that abused me. And because of that, I hate men and I'm going to make my husband pay for something he never did to me. And I'm going to be a psychotic mother because, you know, my girls just deserve all my dysfunction because you don't know what happened. I was a victim and this happened to me 50 years ago and it just wasn't right. I'm getting dizzy. I'm going to stop. Okay. So, and then it just didn't, and we go round and round. You don't know what that boss did to me. You don't know what they said to me at that church back there. You don't know what, it's not my fault. That teacher said that I was not able to do this and that parent said this and 50 years later, in the case of the children of Israel, 40 years later, murmuring, grumbling, complaining. You you don't know how bad it was. You don't know what happened to us. And then we'll sing songs of redemption and songs of the power of the cross and songs of the power of the resurrection, but we don't believe them because we're still doing our same old laps around our same old mountains. And God says, hang on a minute. It's supposed to be 11 days. Yes, there was pain. And no one is denying a process of restoration. Nobody. But it should be 11 days to come out of the slavery of Egypt to walk into the freedom and the promise of Canaan. 40 years later. 40 years later. I wonder what your 40 years later is. 
What bitterness, what unforgiveness, what lust, what greed, what envy, what pride, what addiction, what pain, what suffering, what hurt, what, what, what is it? Still same old mountains, same old issue, same old thing going on. Sat under a thousand sermons, but it's still the same old thing. And you just keep going. And I'll tell you one thing, by the time we finish this, whoever has had like these 50-year issues, your friend is going to turn next to you. And when you try to say, you know, like, go on about that issue again, they're going to go, look, man, she got over it. Maybe, maybe you could too. Maybe you need to get a new issue. But anyway, so the thing is that maybe that it needs to be, we need to get over the fact that, you know, something happened 40 years ago or something happened 50 years ago. I was abused that nothing's ever going to change that. But the fact is I'm 50 years old now. So you do the math. I have not been being abused for 38 years. Why would I allow 12 years to define my whole life when I've not been being abused for a whole lot longer than I have been being abused? Why not talk about the redemptive power of Jesus Christ setting me free and giving a life beyond my past? Why keep talking about the other? I'm not saying deny what happened, but it doesn't have power over me. What Jesus did on the cross does. And for some of us, you've come to church this morning because it's time to make what Jesus did for you bigger than what they did to you. It is time to make what Jesus did for you at Calvary bigger than what those people said to you. Some of you need to make God bigger. You go, what do you mean, Christine? Theologically, how do you make God bigger? God is as big as he ever needs to be. God is as big as he is ever going to be. God is omnipotent. God is omniscient. God is omnipresent. You're right. But the God of the universe is made big or small in the hearts of his people. So how big is your God? How big is your God? What is still going on in your heart? Is your heart still full? Are you having a spiritual heart attack? Because your heart is clogged up. Your spiritual arteries are clogged up with unforgiveness or bitterness or shame or guilt or hurt or condemnation or pride or lust or greed or envy. I don't know what it might be. But we have to allow God to move in so that we can find freedom. Otherwise, we're going to take 40 years to do what it should take us 11 days to do. 40 years, metaphorically speaking, whatever that might be. We are all a work in process. We are all being conformed and transformed to the image of Jesus. That's what we're here for. But the fact is that there should be progress. Scripture teaches us that we go from faith to faith, from grace to grace, from strength to strength. If we are truly going to be salt and light on this earth and make a difference in our generation and see the world transformed around us, then we have to be transformed from the inside out. The greatest testimony we are to this world that Jesus Christ is still alive and Jesus Christ reigns is not a four spiritual laws track. It's the fact that he's reigning in me. It's the fact that he's flowing through me. It's the fact that we can stand up and say, I once was, but now am. There is a change. There is a transformation. Now that happens from the inside out. So of course, in this context, I'm talking about an Old Testament physical promised land. In the New Testament, of course, we're talking about a spiritual promised land. But all the promises of God are in Christ Jesus, yes and amen, Corinthians tells us. Which means you and I, have access to all of the promises of God in the Word of God, but they're not going to fall out of the sky because Jesus has already given them to us. We have to go in and take what is already ours. I'm going to show you that from Scripture if I can get past this second verse. In the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses proclaimed to the Israelites all that the Lord had commanded him concerning them. This was after he had defeated Sihon, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon and at Edrai and defeated Og, king of Bashan, who reigned in that place. East of the Jordan of the territory of Moab, Moses began to expound this law. The Lord our God said to us at Horeb, you have stayed long enough at this mountain. That's what I've come here to say to someone today. You've stayed long enough at that mountain. Long enough at the mountain of guilt, long enough at the mountain of shame, long enough at the mountain of condemnation, long enough at the mountain of defeat, long enough at the mountain of murmuring, long enough at the mountain of complacency, long enough at the mountain of apathy, long enough at the mountain of indifference, long enough at the mountain of addiction, long enough. God comes in after 40 years and he says, hey, you've been here long enough. I love this. Break camp 
an advance. There's got to come a time where you've got to make a decision to disrupt something by breaking camp. You've got to break camp with complacency, break camp with apathy, break camp with people that are holding you back, break camp with the status quo. You ever broken something? It hurts. It hurts. So we've got to break camp and advance. The nature of the gospel is advancing. We are an unshakable kingdom. We're in the midst of a series on being unshakable. I bet you're wondering how I was going to tie it in. And so we are in an unshakable kingdom. I love the book of Hebrews. It says only those things that can be shaken so that those things that cannot be shaken shall remain. We've got a lot of cray-cray things happening in the world today. If you just look at the news, you go, the world is cray-cray. But it is okay because God is not cray-cray because the one thing that cannot be shaken is the church of Jesus Christ. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell cannot, shall not, will not prevail against the church of the living God. She is alive and well. She is alive and well. Just in case you're wondering what we're doing here on a Sunday morning. We are not a bunch of socially dysfunctional morons that had nothing else to do on a Sunday morning. So we went with all the other nerds to church because we're losers. No, we are on the winning side. I read the end of the book. You might think, gee, she's really excited for a Sunday morning. Well, you know why? It's because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Have you ever been into the locker room of a losing football team? So depressing. Everyone's quiet, somber, depressed like a lot of churches on Sunday morning. But have you ever been into the locker room of a winning football team? Everyone is high-fiving. Everyone is excited. Everyone is pumped. Friend, if this is your first time in church today, you think that woman on stage is really, really excited. It's because I read the end of the book and we win. We're on the winning side, church. We're on the winning side. It's okay. It's unshakable. Therefore, we are Christ in us is unstoppable. What's the theology for that? The same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, Scripture says, lives on the inside of you and me. That same spirit that raised Jesus from, if you are saved, Ephesians teaches us that all of us have been sealed until that day of redemption with the Holy Spirit of God. He lives in all of us. So the fact is now we've got to get that flow of God from us into a world around us to bring transformation. He is unshakable, his kingdom is unshakable, and Christ in us, the hope of glory, is unstoppable. It doesn't matter what happens politically, morally, socially, economically, in the world around us, because we have the kingdom of God within us, and we are here to bring a taste of heaven to earth and bring change around us. And so the Lord's saying to the children of Israel, I brought you out of 430 years of slavery in Egypt. And you came out of Egypt, you came out of it, And there was an 11-day wilderness. In fact, Scripture teaches us that God took them the long way around through the wilderness. Not every wilderness experience is from the devil. Sometimes God will take us the long way around to get us into our destiny. And he took them through the wilderness. 11 days. That's what it was supposed to take. And you go, well, why does God do that? Because although they had come out of Egypt, Egypt had not yet come out of them. And so God had to get Egypt out of them. They came out of slavery, but they still thought like slaves and they still acted like slaves. See, you can get saved and delivered out of a situation, but then there's a time of sanctification, which is our whole life on earth, and where God gets what was in us out of us and we replace that with what's in Him and His Word. So some of the major stuff, 11 days, but they just camped 40 years later because they murmured, grumbled, and complained. And scripture goes on at the end of Deuteronomy chapter one. It talks about Moses said, you wanted to spy out the land. I sent 12 leaders in to spy out the land. God said he was giving us that land. But 10 of the leaders came back with a negative report. Oh, you should see the economy. You should see the political system. You should see the morality. Oh, it's so bad. It's all falling apart. We cannot go in. And only one, two guys, Joshua and Caleb came back and said, what are you all talking about? We are well able to take the land. God said he's given it to us. We can take what he said he's given. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. It's exactly the same today. We have nothing to fear because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So everywhere we go, we transform the world around us. But what happened was 10 leaders came back with a negative report and kept a whole generation out of their destiny. That's why what we blog does matter. What we tweet does matter. What we Facebook does matter. 
What we put out there does matter. Are you part of the conversation of naysayers and negativity and fear and doubt in this nation? Or are we part of the conversation of life-giving, hope and faith? Are we building up those around us or are we tearing them down? Because the words of 10 people kept a whole generation out of their destiny. 10 people that said, we can't do it. 10 people that said, it's too hard. I know that God said we have victory, but we can't, can't do it. We have this moment in history and this moment in this nation at the moment where we, the church, can change the narrative. If we speak words of life and hope and faith in our sphere of influence, let people know that Jesus is still in control, that he is unshakable and his church is unstoppable and his love and his grace and his mercy and his compassion, it continues to reign. And we walk in the victory that is ours in and through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Ten people kept a generation out of their destiny and God said, you know what? You've stayed here long enough. I want you to go and advance. He says, see, in verse 8, see, I have given you this land. Go in and take possession of the land the Lord swore he would give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac. Go in and take possession. And there's some of us, we need to go in and take possession. God has given us the inheritance. I can leave an inheritance for my daughters, but it's not going to fall out of the sky. They've got to go in and take what I've left. So freedom was mine. I had been abused, I had been hurt, I had been rejected, I'd been abandoned. All of those things are very real. But in and through a relationship with Jesus Christ, I now had access to freedom, to come out of that brokenness and walk into the fullness of the freedom of what God has for me. How did I do that? I had to let God come in. If you want to find freedom in Christ and walk into your spiritual promised land, then you cannot just visit God on Sundays. He wants to move into your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. The Bible says in John 1:14, I love Eugene Peterson's version in the message. He says, the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. God wants to move into the neighborhood. See, a lot of us, we could, we could visit him on Sunday because what do you do when you have a, good, a visitor come to your house? If you're having visitors today for lunch, you've cleaned the lounge room, it's really nice and neat. You've gone into the kids' bedrooms. You've thrown all the dirty undies into the cupboards and just, you know, made it all nice. You've gone into the bathroom. You've got rid of the sandpaper and you've put really nice soft toilet paper into the bathroom because the visitors are coming. You've got rid of the cheap cookies and you've got the really good chocolate cake. But if the kids have touched it while you're gone, they're dead because that's for the visitors. It's all nice. And the visitor comes at the appointed time. He sits there. It's all lovely. We all have a nice time. You have threatened the kids. There are no Christmas presents for the next 20 years if they fight when the visitors are there. I mean, you've done it all. And so then, as soon as the visitor leaves, I mean, honestly, like World War 15 has just broken out in the house. Well, you know, we do that when we come to church every week. Well, not, not here at Saddleback, but every other church in North America, just not here, okay. But you could be coming to church, driving to church, and I mean, you're having a full-on fight in the car. You've nearly killed the kids. You've said lots of four-letter words. None of them are love. None of them are in the Bible. And so you are, are just going, and you pull into that church parking lot, and I'm telling you, it happens the world over, that the spirit of hypocrisy it just comes upon us all. And you get to this front door. I mean, you've nearly killed everyone, but now you get to the front door and the greeter from the welcome team with a nice t-shirt meets you and says, you know, how are you this morning? And you're like, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. It's amazing. You know, I've been sanctified, justified and redeemed by the blood of the lamb. In fact, here's my cherubim and my seraphim and they're going into kids church and it's all wonderful. And you know, we just go, I'm blessed. And you're sitting through worship. I worship you, oh mighty God. I hate his guts if he thinks he's getting any this month. Anyway, it's amazing what you could be thinking on a Sunday morning with your unsanctified mind. And so it is all happening. Pastor Rick brings a beautiful message. You're taking notes. I mean, you do not even get the door closed in the car, in the parking lot before you've hit your spouse. Did you hear what Pastor Rick said? Every word was for you. It was for you, every word. <laughs> and, and maybe you're still going to be a Christian by tonight, maybe, on a good Sunday, on a good Sunday. But by Monday, your evil twin has turned up. <laughs> and the kids are like, Jekyll and Hyde, what is going on? And by Tuesday, you hate yourself because you've got this yo-yo Christianity and you actually don't even want that. You want to be more like Christ. So you try more, you pray more, you fast more. And it doesn't work and eventually you give up and you end up just turning up out of a religious obligation and you really don't think God's power can change your life because you tried. 
And he says, the issue isn't you trying, you can't do more. You've got to allow his spirit to come in and move in. See, I had locked God out of a lot of broken places in my life. I had locked him out. I had made vows. I will never trust like that. I'll show them if they think. I'll do. And I had locked God's light out of the healing places in my life. And I had to let God move in. That's very painful. And really through the book and curriculum, that's what I unpack. And I don't know that there's a greater gift I could have given the body turning 50 going, you know what, let me just tell you, you can walk into freedom. You don't have to die in the wilderness, saved, delivered, but not free. You can say yes when God says go, but you can only say yes if you're strong enough in him to do it. And there's a process. It does take 11 days. You have to commit to that process. And that process is painful. There's no doubt about it. But there is victory on the other side. And you can walk into the fullness of what God says. So the first point was that you have to let God move in if you're going to move on. And the second point is you must embrace the pain of recovery. You know, a couple of years ago, um, I went skiing with my family. I'm, I'm from Sydney, Australia, so we surf. There's no snow. You know, we don't know how to ski. But because there was five American families there and I was... Um, Australian with my family, I felt a moral obligation to represent Australia and look like I could ski. And so I would sort of watch the ski Olympics at night and then I would try to copy what they were doing in the day, which is really not wise. If you are underage, do not do this. And so, but you know, I was useless. I could only ski on the flat green slope. So this one day I made my husband come with me, but all his mates, all the guys, were skiing down this uh, double black diamond, you know, kill a run kind of thing. And um, I was skiing away, you know, just barely moving. And um, I said to my husband, honey, if you were with the guys right now, you wouldn't be having any more fun, would you? And um, any, anyone that's married in this room and wants to remain married, if your wife ever asks you a loaded question like that, the correct answer always, without exception, there is never an exception, is always to say, yes, honey, you know, the pinnacle of my ski life is on this flat green slope <laughs> with you. This just makes my day. Um, you know, if you were wanting any action that night, married men, that's exactly what you would say to your wife. I'm just throwing it out there. Um, that was for free. That was worth coming to church right there. Some of you just woke up for the first time. She just said that? Okay, so. Um, and, and so the issue is my husband, being a man of integrity, says to me, you know what, honey? If I was, I wish I was with the guys right now, we would, I'd be having so much more fun. I'm like, what planet are you on? Okay, so, his famous last words, I said to him, my skis were loaded downwards. I go, well, honey, eat my snow. And then I took off downhill. About 20 seconds later, no, not one word of a lie, 20 seconds later, I knew I was in serious trouble on my second somersault that was not intentional. And as I was hanging upside down, one of my skis went flying, the other one stayed on, and I heard the loudest pop, pop, pop that you have heard. I snapped my ACL, tore my MCL, tore my meniscus, and fractured my knee. There's obviously a lot of athletes in the room. So I did it all. Couldn't move. You know, they had to get the ski patrol. They put you in that little coffin thing. You go down the mountain. And um, that's more painful than the injury, I'm telling you. And everyone's like, who's that? What a nerd. I'm like, yes, that was me. Anyway, so on all of that point, my mother, being good Greek Orthodox, my mother all my life used to say to me before I left home, Christina, are you wearing good, clean underwear? <laughs> to which I would say, Mom, what does it matter? Christina. Think my big fat Greek wedding. If you have an accident and you end up in the back of an ambulance, you must be wearing good underwear for the ambulance driver. <laughs> Therein is Greek logic, everyone. Greeks are fatalist. It doesn't matter how bad things are. They could always get worse. And so I used to always say to my mother, Mom, I'm not believing to have an accident. And if I have an accident where I end up in the back of an ambulance, I don't care about the condition of my underwear. All I'm saying, because this is Sunday morning and I'm being respectful, if it was a women's conference, you would get the unedited version, let me just say. But as they were lifting me up into the ambulance, all I want to say to you is I've lived long enough again to say the words yet again, my mother was right. Okay, so that's all I'm saying. So 
I ended up, they flew me back to Australia. I had a hamstring graft and the doctor came in and I'm going to end with this because this is what we have to understand. If we're going to take 11 days, not 40 years, if we're going to step into the freedom that is ours in Christ, if we're going to appropriate what Jesus did for us on the cross, because there is freedom and our world needs to see that you can be free. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says, it's for freedom Christ set us free. And this freedom is not based on a personality. It's not because Chris Kane's a strong personality. Freedom is not a personality type. Freedom is a blood type. It's the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that sets us free. So we can all walk in freedom. We can all walk in the fullness of what God has for us. But this is what we have to do. The PT came into me and he said, you know, Mrs. Kane, you've had a very serious injury. And I know you, I think you do patella grafts here in America. We do hamstring grafts in Australia. He came in and he said, your, your right knee technically now after the hamstring graft, your right knee is stronger than your left knee. But most people do not fully recover from this injury. You can have a full life. You can go down and up. You can begin running. You can do it, but most won't. And if you're a professional athlete, this would have ended your career. He said, it's not necessarily that you can't because your knee is stronger. He said, but I need you to know that most people don't commit to the recovery process because the injury was painful, but it happened in a split second. The recovery process is much longer. And more often than not, the pain of recovery far outweighs the pain of the injury. He says, so it's your choice, Mrs. Kane. You can recover completely or partially. You can recover quickly or slowly. It is entirely your choice. And then he said these words. The degree to which you are willing to embrace the pain of recovery is the degree to which you will recover. And I'm here to say to us as the body of Christ today, none of us could suffer more than Jesus Christ did on the cross. None of us could pay a bigger price than our Heavenly Father loving us so much that He gave His only begotten Son. But if you and I are truly going to walk into the freedom of our future, if we are not going to allow our history to define our destiny, if we are going to allow the broken shards and the broken places of our heart to be healed and whole, if we are going to allow God to go in and deep so that He can do a great and mighty work through us, which is the purpose of God for us. It is to our Father's great glory, John says, that we would bear much fruit. We are on this planet in this time to be highly effective for the kingdom of God. It gives our God great glory for us to bear much fruit. You will not bear fruit if you keep saying no when God says go because you are stuck in the wilderness when you should be in the promised land. So let's make a decision as the body of Christ that we're going to allow God to move in so we can move on. We are going to embrace the pain of recovery and we are going to trust that the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is going to give us the grace to do what we could never do in our own strength. And if we are feeling weary, and if we are feeling worn out in the middle of the wilderness and dry, my Bible says in Isaiah that those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. We will mount up on wings like eagles. Guess what the promise is for us young 50-year-olds? We will run and not grow weary. We will walk and not faint. It's not about what you and I can do or can't do. It's not about what you and I are or are not. It's about who Christ is on the inside of us. And our God is big and our God is great. And there is nothing that our God cannot do. There is not a disease He cannot heal. There is not a mountain He cannot move. There is not a soul He cannot save. There is not a need He cannot meet. There is not a heart He cannot mend. There is not a pain He cannot redeem. There is nothing Nothing our God cannot do. And because there is nothing that our God cannot do, and the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives on the inside of us, then guess what? I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. We could do it, church. We could do it in Jesus' name. We could do great things for the glory of God's saddleback. We can do great things. We can move on and we can possess in Jesus' name. Come on, if you believe it, give Jesus a mighty ovation in this place today. Come on. Hallelujah. We can do great things. We can do great things. Praise God. Let me pray for you. Stand to your feet. Let me pray. 
Man, we came to have church this morning. I love you, Saddleback, like family. I love Pastor Kay so dearly. Nick and I so honor and respect Pastor Rick and Kay. Your church is so significant in the body of Christ, what God is doing through you. But sometimes you can get caught up in the momentum of what God's doing as a church, Saddleback, and forget that you as an individual are part of that. And momentum is only as strong as impetus. So the more we keep putting in, the more we'll keep putting out. It takes all of us together. God knows the situation in America, economically, politically, morally, socially, environmentally, in every realm. And the Bible teaches us in the book of Acts that God picks and chooses the times and places he puts us in. So he knew what was going on. And you are his plan A for being salt and light to this generation in this generation. But we've got to move on and get over our stuff in order to do what God's called us to do. If you're able, why don't you just bow your heads and let me just pray. So Father, I thank you for every person in this room. I thank you for this mighty house. I thank you for Pastor Rick and Kay. I thank you that Saddleback's greatest days are still ahead and not behind. And so I pray for every single person under the sound of my voice online in this room. And Lord, together we just commit ourselves afresh this Sunday morning. I do too. That Lord, we're committed to allowing you to keep moving into those deep places of our hearts so that we can keep moving on into the purpose that you have for us. That we're willing to embrace the pain of recovery so that we can freely move into the promised land that you have for us. So Jesus, we say, have your way. The fact that we are still living and breathing means you've still got a plan and you've still got a purpose and it's not over. And we want to live every day on mission and intentionally. We don't want to die and get to heaven and go, I missed it. We thank you for the privilege of serving you in our generation. We thank you for the privilege of being on the planet at this time to bring hope and life and proclaim the gospel to a lost and a broken world. So Father, I pray that freedom would be in the house this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ, I speak freedom and life and liberty. I pray that everyone would have strength and courage to do what you've called us to do today, to let go of the past, to break camp, to advance and move on and step up and into the promises of God in Jesus' name. And all God's people said,